Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar, Risk Management for Project Leaders. Today's webinar will be presented by Ms. Suzanne Madsen. Suzanne provides executive coaching and is helping organizations to improve their project leadership capabilities. She has authored two books about these topics and is a member of the Association for Project Management or APM. I wish you all a great webinar. So welcome everybody to the webinar today about risk management. I am going to share with you lots of tips and tools for how you can become excellent at managing risks. But you will see the word leader in here as well. It is for project leaders. And that means that we will very much look at how you can become a leader in this process. Uh, this is about risk management for project leaders. Basically, I'm going to share with you today lots of tips and tools for how you can become really, really good at managing risks, but not just managing risks. I want you to walk away from today's webinar with some real leadership tips, because risk management is not just about going through the motion and ticking boxes. That can be absolutely useless. I want you to apply thought and consideration and leadership to the process. What are we going to cover? We're going to look at what a risk is, um, just a brief introduction. Then I'm going to take you through, step by step, the nine-step risk management process from A to Z, really. We're also going to cover some of the most common mistakes in risk management. I want to ensure that you don't make those mistakes so that you can go on, manage your projects, and make sure you don't have issues turn up. Then I'm also going to share with you how you can lead a risk management workshop. Many project managers shy away from leading workshops. I want to make sure that's not you. So I'm going to give you some tips for how to lead it. When we run workshops, in collaboration with the team, you get much better engagement, and it takes some of the pressure off your own shoulders because they're going to share with you the process. And then we're going to finish off with what your own risk attitude is, but I'm going to leave that till the end to explain what that is. I would like you all to become clear on what you would like to learn from this webinar and uh, have pen and paper with you and write down what you want to get from it. Uh, maybe you find that you're one of those who often end up assigning yourself to most of the risks. If that happens, it's definitely a clear sign that you have something to learn because risks shouldn't just be owned by the project manager. A little bit about myself before we go on. I have 20 years of experience leading change programs, mainly in the financial services sector, in between technology and the business. I've written two books. One is the Project Management Coaching Workbook, and the other one is The Power of Project Leadership. It came out a year ago, and I'm delighted to tell you that it is being translated into Chinese. For the last three years, I have been uh, full-time coaching, uh, project managers, training project managers, and running workshops in project leadership and risk management. If you would like to know more, please visit my website, suzannematson.com. Actually, on my website, there is a resources page where you can sign up for free to get all of my resources, including some of the risk management templates like a risk log that I'm going to share with you today. So please don't miss out on that. It is completely free. Just go to the website, suzannematson.com. So, the first question, and this is where I realized no one was listening because I got, had no responses. Now, please, can I have your responses in the chat box? Which one of these is a risk? Is it number one, we might not have enough budget? Is it number two, we can't meet the deadline? Is it number three, the project is using untested technology? Or is it number four, the organization does not use sponsors? Oh, we have lots of people saying number three, the project is using untested technology. You're wrong. It is not number three. Please try again. <laughs> All of the above, one is saying. No, only one of these is a risk, and it is not number three. This is interesting, isn't it? We're getting all kinds of responses. Okay, let me help you out. Number one is a risk. We might not have enough budget. Why is that? Because risks are items that may happen. We might not have enough budget. We don't know, but we might not. That's, that's a risk. Number three and number four, the project is using untested technology. The organization does not use sponsors. They're written in present tense. They're statements. They might lead to risks, but they're not in themselves risks. They're statements. They could cause risks, but they're not. 
risks always begin with something that might happen or could happen or is probable. Number two, we can't meet the deadline. To me, that sounds like an issue. It is something that is a problem right now. So what is the difference? Well, a risk is uncertainty <clears throat> that matters, as it says here in bullet number two. It is really an uncertain event that, if it occurs, has a positive or negative effect on objectives. That means that risks may not happen. They may happen. We don't know. There is a probability of it happening from between 1 and 99%. Whereas issues, they have already happened. It is something that is currently impacting the project. That means that issues have a probability of 100%. They are already there. You're having to deal with them. There are two dimensions of risk. One of them is probability, as I just mentioned. Another word for probability is likelihood. It is exactly the same thing. How likely or unlikely is the risk to happen? If I say to you, it will rain tomorrow, I don't know. My iPhone tells me there's a 50% likelihood. You know, I live in London, so it rained, It has rained here several times today. And, but is that a risk? It might rain tomorrow. There's a 50% probability. Well, it depends what I'm going to do tomorrow. If I'm going to stay indoors and, and write a, a project report, it has no impact on me at all. So it doesn't really matter. Um, but if I'm telling you that there's going to be a snowstorm tomorrow and you are having to go to work, then I'm sure it's a risk to you because it could impact your journey. The other dimension of risk is impact. In case the risk happens, there will be an impact or an effect on the project's objectives. That impact could be positive or negative, because risks can actually be positive as well as negative. Most normally, we talk about um, negative risks. Something bad will happen that could prevent your project from moving forward. And that's the majority of the focus of today's webinar. But there is such a thing as positive risks. We also call them opportunities. That's when something happens, and it may even have a positive impact. Imagine, for instance, that you are um, launching a new website to sell a new product. There is a risk that it's oversubscribed and that you won't have enough products to send out. But actually, there is an opportunity here, because if you put more stock if, if, you, if you gather more stock, you could actually sell more if you are prepared for this risk that you might sell out. So you see that there could be, we can sum, with, with, sorry, with positive risks, it's about leveraging the opportunity. When we come to looking at risk management in more detail later about how to, how to mitigate it, we need to look at both probability and impact. We need to lower the probability and lower the impact in case the risk happens. But why does all of this matter in the first place? Why do we care about risk management? Well, we care because it's all about avoiding issues to happen later in your project. For instance, uh, if we say there is a risk that our um, technology isn't going to work because we use new technology, so there's a risk. So let's say we are using untested technology, hence there is a risk that we might be late because there could be unforeseen work involved. If we do nothing about that, then it could turn out to be an issue and it could delay your project. But if you do something about it, you could prevent it from happening. So that's really why we care. You see on projects there are lots of issues all the time. We have scope creep, we have disharmony on the team, the team is not pulling their weight, we have lots of defects, all of these issues are very likely to be as a result of not having looked at what could go wrong and not having mitigated the risks in advance. So we're now going to go through the nine-step risk management process. I'm just going to tell you now what the nine steps are, and then we're going to go into them in more detail, one by one. The first step is to identify risks and also opportunities. That means positive as well as negative risks. Then we need to analyze the root causes, because otherwise it becomes difficult to do something about it. Then we need to determine impact and determine probability. 
only then can we decide on what to do. What are the risk responses that we're going to do, that we're going to take? And who is going to own them, the risk responses and the risks? Then it's about documenting risks. This is where we have a risk log. We need to communicate risks at in weekly status report meetings and steering committee meetings. And finally, we need to review what we're doing regularly. This is the overview of the process. We're now going to go into it in more detail because there's a lot to say about each of these. And we have to remember that we're not just doing the process. We want to be leaders, not just managers. So let me just remind you of the differences between management and leadership. Management is where we just, I'm saying just, but there is a big need for managers. But this is more about processes, doing things right. Um, Calculation. So in a risk management context, it's about locking the risks and, um, <clears throat> you know, following the process of risk management. But leadership is much more people-oriented. It's about bringing people with you. It's about embedding a risk culture into your team. It's about making sure that it's the right people who own the risks. It's about making sure that it's, it's the right actions we're taking against the risks. I don't care if you have a risk register. I care about whether you have the right risks logged, whether you're doing something useful about the risk, and whether the right people are owning them. So a big part of being a leader here is to engage people with risk workshops, as we're going to talk about later on, and that you really take a step back and look at all the risks um, aggregated as well. What does this tell me? Yeah, so it's really about being mindful and applying some thought into the process. Let's go back to step number one of the risk management process about identifying risks and opportunities. How do we do that? Well, I propose that you organize risk workshops. I'm going to tell you later on in the webinar how to do that. Ask people what they worry about. If you ask people what risks can you think of, sometimes their mind goes blank. They're not really sure, but if you ask people what do you worry about, what could stop us from moving forward, what could go wrong? Oh, they can definitely answer those questions. So maybe sometimes you need to rephrase your questions to make sure that people think differently about this. If you sit down in isolation and list out all the risks that might happen on your project, chances are that uh, you're not going to be as thorough as if you engage the entire team. Also, when you engage the entire team, you get buy-in from them, and it's easier to have other people help you to own the risks. That way you can begin to create a risk culture. It shouldn't just be the project manager carrying this. So risk workshops, super, super important. Um, as you do the risk workshops, you can also use risk lists to prompt you to, to look at what um, might go wrong. Yet there are lots of standard risk lists out there on the internet. And also involve people from outside the project. Why might you want to invite or involve people from outside the project into your risk workshop? I'll tell you why, because your team has limited knowledge. People outside of your team have more knowledge. Maybe you're running a project that your team hasn't tried before, but someone else has done a very similar project. If you invite them into your risk workshop, they can help you look at risks that you hadn't even thought about. We call those the unknown unknowns. When you sit down and you identify all the risks that could happen in your project, what you are really identifying are the known unknowns. It's the risks that you know about. But there are risks that you don't even know about. They come in from the left field, and you didn't even see them. We sometimes call those for black swans. You can really work with them <clears throat> um, and help mitigate them by inviting outsiders into your project to help you see what you don't see. And then remember in your risk workshop to also look at positive risks. What are the opportunities here? What are, what are the opportunities? that we can leverage in case they happen. So that's step number one, identify anything that could go wrong or any opportunities that if we don't do something about it now, we're going to miss out on that opportunity. I would like to ask you to type into the chat box which risks you feel we often forget about on a project. I'm keen to hear your views. Which risks are often forgotten about? In your experience, <clears throat> please type your answers. Communication, uh, test systems, scope creep, human factors. Oh, I like that one, uh, Vadim. Uh, human factor, absolutely, we often forget about that one. 
ignoring the stakeholders, end use impact, that's very interesting. Yes, we often ignore those risks. Procurement, hardware, again, human factors, uh, politics. Oh, we have everything here. Monetary issues. Yeah, I find people mostly identify those, but involving our stakeholders, you mentioned a great one um, uh, that's often forgotten about. Vendor management, again, non-technical risks. Oh, excellent. You have lots of stuff coming up here. Now, um, I agree with all of those. In, in my experience, and you will see here the swing on, on the... Um, on, on the uh, in, in the overview here, the, the, the image, sorry. Um, the customer wanted a, a swing with three tiers on it. That's what they explained. I think we often are quite good at identifying this risk that the team might design it wrong. You know, so we can do things about that. But what we don't often see is that the customer needed something completely different. We're so caught up in what the customer says they want us to deliver. We get so caught up in specifications, we forget to ask ourselves, is it the right specification? Is there a risk here that the customer doesn't know what they need? Yes, that is a risk. But most teams, in my experience, forget about it. Another risk, and I'm very pleased you mentioned it here, is the human aspects. You know, people fall out, working relationships break down, People misinterpret uh, contracts that have been written. They fall out over that. But how many risk logs have you seen where we actively go in and mitigate people-related issues or, or risks early on? As you're saying here, the human side of it. So I'm very pleased that some of you are mentioning that. Uh, I don't want to see risk logs just with technical risks in them. I want to see real risk logs. What is it really that could prevent us from moving forward? What is it that could derail this project? Yes, human factors, absolutely, but what are we going to do about it? The second step is to identify the root cause, and you'll see here that we have a fishbone diagram that will help us to work, work backwards and find out what really causes this uh, risk. Keep asking why, but why? And I'll give you an example. Let's say you have a risk on your project that a key team member may leave the company. You've heard someone talk about it. Joe may leave the company. He's job hunting. Oh, and you start panicking. Oh my God, what's the likelihood? 50%, 80%, but for sure it's a risk. What are you going to do about that? Well, you could do a number of things. You could make sure that he writes documentation. You could make sure that uh, you, you line someone else up so that if Joe leaves, then you have someone else who can take over. But you see, that is not addressing the root cause. If you ask, what's really the reason why Joe might want to leave? If you go and have a conversation with Joe, you might find out that Joe doesn't feel that he gets enough variety or autonomy in his job. He doesn't like the working conditions. He doesn't like his salary or whatever else it is. That's what you really need to address if you want to keep him on board. Uh, it may not, you know, if, if you just line an, up another person, you have not addressed the root cause. Joe might leave. You can hand over to another team member. That means that you lessen the impact, but you're not, you're not fundamentally avoiding this risk from happening. So if you always understand the root cause of your risks, it will be much easier for you to actually choose the best mitigating strategy and to really find out what you can do about it. The third and the fourth step <clears throat> is to look at the impact and the probability of each of the risks that you have identified. The worst risks, of course, are those with a high probability and a high impact in the top right-hand corner with the dark color. What you'll see in the top left-hand side is something with a low probability and a high impact. This is risks that might not happen, but if they happen, oh boy, they're going to have a big impact. For instance, it's very unlikely that something will happen to the, your building, your physical building. Like uh, the building disappears, there's an explosion, there's a bomb hitting it or whatever. It's very unlikely. If it happens, then it's going to have a major impact. Uh, for instance, when uh, the Twin Towers in New York went down many years ago now. 
that is why most companies have disaster recovery, they have backup plans, they have contingencies uh, in case something happens to your site and to your data. There's a very low probability, but the impact is so high that we do something about those risks. On the other end of the spectrum here, towards the uh, bottom right-hand side, you have something with a high probability and low impact. This means that, yeah, there's a risk that people might leave your project, for instance, it's quite, let's say it's quite uh, likely, this has a high probability, but it has low impact because you have other people who can take over, let's say. That is much easier to deal with than something that has a high impact. So you really must be aware of risks with a high impact. The other thing that we sometimes do is that you can identify risks, lots of risks, some of them have low probability, low impact, but you're not going to do something about all of them. You can draw your risk profile here with the red line and say that anything towards the top right-hand corner of this red line, you're going to do something about. The other ones, you're going to accept. Where this red line is drawn will depend on your risk appetite, the risk appetite of the company, the organization, and or the risk appetite of your project. The question you are asking is, how much risk are we ready to take? And can we afford for something to go wrong? If you're working in the aircraft industry, if you're working for Boeing or for Airbus, chances are that this red line doesn't exist because they cannot afford for anything to go wrong. So the risk appetite is very, very, and this red line will be right down in the um, left-hand corner, bottom left-hand corner. On the other hand, if you're working for a hedge fund, which are those financial institutions that take lots of risk, um, well, their risk appetite is going to be very high. So this red line will be very much towards the upper uh, right-hand side of this matrix. It means that they're going to accept most of the risks. They're going to deal with it if it happens. My guess is that most organizations have a risk profile in between uh, somewhere where I have drawn it right now. So this is very useful to find out um, and to decide with your team, what are we going to do, uh, which risks are we going to address and which risks are we not going to address, what is our risk appetite, are we going to do something about even our minor risks or only something about our top risks. When you look at the impact of a risk, well, the impact on what? Well, what's the impact of a risk on time, cost, quality? That's really what you need to ask. Does it impact materially the success criteria? of the project. So let's go back to this untested technology again. There is a risk that because we're using untested technology, our project could be late because there may be unforeseen issues with it. That means that it could impact time, it could impact cost because we might have to throw more people at it or find better technology. It could even impact quality because we don't know. It's, it's really a, a, a risk here. So for sure, that's the impact, look at the impact on time, cost, quality. But that's not all. You also need to look at the other triangle. This is more the strategic triangle, the business case triangle. Does this risk impact the effect that the project is, uh, the project's effect on the strategic objectives? So what do I mean by that? Every project has an effect on strategic objectives, or should have. Strategic projects um, have strategic objectives. If your risk is impacting the strategic objectives, then it's quite serious. Also, is your risk impacting the relevance to the users? Any good project that has a good business case is delivering something that's relevant to the users. Is your risk making your product or your project less, more or less relevant? And the last one is sustainability. Is this risk impacting sustainability of your project? So you see this top triangle is really about the business case of the project. <clears throat> it's about delivering value, not just delivering time, cost, quality. So when you assess the impact of a risk, you need to assess the impact on all of these six dimensions. This fifth, sorry, the fifth step, after you have identified root causes and determined impact and probability of every risk, is to decide on the risk responses. <clears throat> These are the standard risk responses that we have out there according to the PM Buck. You can reduce a risk, <clears throat> avoid it, accept it, share it, or transfer it. 
when you transfer a risk, it really means sometimes that you take out a, um, you, you can have a partnership with a, with a vendor, you can write a contract, meaning that they, um, if something happens, then they take on the risk. If you take out an insurance, for instance, you're really transferring the risk to the insurance broker. If you have a partnership, um, you can share risks with a partner. Um, but I think the most common risk responses are actually to reduce the risk. And uh, we can look at um, <clears throat> and an example. For instance, if you're planning to run an outdoor event, let's say you're planning to run an outdoor concert, and there is a risk of rain now. What can you do to reduce the risk of rain? Well, that's a hard one, isn't it? But you could move the event to a region where it's less likely to rain. Um, but you can also reduce the impact in case it does rain. What would you do to reduce the impact? Well, you could hand out umbre umbrellas. You could hand out ponchos. So you see, when we reduce uh, a risk, we need to look at reducing the um, impact as well as the likelihood. That's very important to get that. Don't just reduce the impact. No, also look at the root cause and, and actually look at how you can reduce the likelihood of this risk happening. You can avoid the risk of rain for your outdoor concert by having it indoors. Or you can simply accept it. On the right-hand side, you see the risk responses to opportunities that we also call positive risks. This is all about exploiting a risk, making it more likely to happen because you want to reap the positive benefits. All right. The sixth step is to assign owners, now that you have decided, what you are going to do about each of your risks. This is where I see many project managers go wrong, because they simply assign themselves to the risks. <clears throat> they feel that just because they're the project manager, they should deal with the risk. But that's not true. You must assign the right owner for each risk. Make sure that this owner accepts responsibility. One of the best ways of doing that is making sure that people are part of deciding who to own each risk. It shouldn't just be you as a project manager deciding who owns what. No, decide this in collaboration. The seventh step is to document your risks. This is a standard risk, uh, risk log that you see um, out there. You can log your risks with a unique identifier, the date, Category, is it something to do with resourcing or technology? It will really just help you to um, filter for the risks afterwards. You put in the risk description and the probability and impact. Is it high, medium, low? You can also use scales from 1 to 5 or 1 to 3. Who is the owner and what is the risk response? <clears throat> what are we going to do about this risk? And what's the date for when we're going to take action? As I said earlier on, you can log on to my website and download this risk list. Simply go to my resources page and register for free. The eighth step is very important. This is about communicating risks. This is again where leadership comes in. You have to be able to show that you are a leader, that you're not afraid of talking about the things that could go wrong on your project. I recommend that you include the top five risks in your weekly reporting and also in the monthly steering committee pack that you're hopefully putting together for your steering committee. Make sure you discuss what these risks are. What is really, what could really hit us here? Do I need any of the senior managers help in addressing some of the major risks? And by the way, always communicate big risks in person to your stakeholders. If you just write you know, a big risk in, in a report and send it out, and that's where they see it for the first time, that is really something you should avoid. Do not make that mistake. Make sure that you see people in person or that you call them to talk through something important that's happening. <clears throat> you know what we say. Managers don't want issues presented to them. They want solutions. So yes, you do need to talk about risks, but you do need to show that you've thought about what you're going to do about it. You are simply running your risk responses by the most senior executives to make them feel comfortable and to, I suppose, get their buy-in for what you're doing about some of the major risks that could hit your project. Of course, if you are doing something major to address a risk that could, um, that will, is going to cost more, let's say we're going back to our untested technology again. 
what might you do to reduce the risk of <clears throat> your untested technology impacting the project? Well, you could run a prototype. Uh, you could do a demo or, yeah, run a working prototype. Well, that might cost us more to do that. Then you need to ask for extra money to implement this risk mitigation strategy. That's some of the things that you need to get approval for from your project board. <clears throat> I hope that makes sense. Some of your risk, risk responses actually requires that extra funding or extra time is set aside. The ninth step is to regularly, regularly review your risks. I see far too many project managers creating a risk register and then they never look at it again. But that is utterly pointless. Risks will keep cropping up on your project, so you need to keep having risk workshops and keep reviewing your risk logs and asking the team what could go wrong and what are we going to do about it. Have, risk, have your review meetings with the team. Also, set time aside in your own diary to look at what could go wrong. Routinely ask people what they worry about and what opportunities they see. As I said before, you might not want to use the word risk because people don't always connect with the word risk if you ask them what risks they see. Ask them what they worry about. Ask them what is holding them, what could be holding them up. Now, a question for you for the chat box. What are we going to do about the unknown unknowns? That means the risks that you haven't thought about. I actually gave you the answer a little bit earlier on in the webinar. Let's see if you remember. Do we have any suggestions? Management reserve, yes. We can actually set contingency budget aside for the unknown unknowns. In case something happens, we can have contingency or management reserve for it. Contingency plan, people are saying, mitigate. Oh, yes, and someone is saying bring in outside, outside eyes. That's exactly right. Help other people to identify the things that you haven't been able to identify yourself. Because things are only risks because we haven't seen them coming. Other people might see them and might say to you, you know what, I ran a project like this in the past. Um, have you thought about this and that could go wrong? And you go, oh my god, we hadn't even thought about that. So that reduces uncertainty by inviting other people in. And uh, yes, what you're saying, management reserve, contingency plans. So uh, you absolutely nailed it. Oh, it's great to see workarounds. It's great to see all of your, all of your comments. <clears throat> so what are the most common mistakes that I see in risk management? I would like all of you to say that, wow, you're not making these mistakes. That would be fantastic. OK, mistake number one, treating risk management as a mechanical process, where we just have a risk register, and we think that we've done risk management well by just filling in the risk register. That could uh, that is so far from the truth, as I hope that today's webinar is showing you, there is much more to it, much more thought we need to put into it. Planning in isolation and not drafting in the team. You have to, and I cannot emphasize this enough, risk management is a collaborative effort. You want to create a risk culture in your organization and in your team where everybody's thinking about risks, where everybody's owning the risks, and where we naturally mitigate them should not just be the project manager doing this. The way you change that culture is by running risk workshops, which I'll show you um, on the next uh, slide, how to run those risk workshops. Also, not assigning old whole owners to the risks or holding them to account. Do not just assign yourself to the risks. Um, it is not the most effective. As a project manager, you are monitoring the process. You are not owning all of the risks. Again collaborative risk workshops where you um, have people volunteer to own risks is a really good way of doing this. If the risks cannot be owned by the team but need to be owned by senior management, then take them to your sponsor and say, who is the best person to own this risk? I feel that it is beyond our team. We need some, someone higher up to help us own this risk. Do not try to hide it. It shows leadership that you can bring that to the attention of senior management. Not considering positive risks or people risks. Uh, we talked about this before. Uh, people, I mean, projects are full of people. And, um, you know, if just we didn't have people, it would be much easier, wouldn't it? Uh, because people create trouble. And people are irrational, and people have emotions, and people fall out. So uh, it's very important that you consider when you start up your project, what what's the real risk here? Do I have different cultures involved? Um, 
do we have different vendors involved? Do we have difficult stakeholders? What am I going to do to mitigate uh, any people-related issues? What can I do to create more, more trust in the team so that we avoid uh, people-related issues? <clears throat> what can we do to, to create better, better bonding and better collaboration? And positive risks. Uh, look at your team at the opportunities. What are the positive things that could happen here? What might happen? What, what opportunities might occur that if we are not ready for them, we cannot reap them? Uh, very important to ask that question. I think this angle is overlooked. We only always think about the negative things that might happen. But what about the positive things? What about new technology that might come out in the process? If we're not ready for new technology, we can't leverage that opportunity. So that's a really good example of a positive risk. Not considering unknown unknowns. Uh, we talked about that. Uh, as we said, put, a, put aside contingency for the unknown unknowns and invite outsiders into the team to help you identify some of the risks that you cannot see yourself. Okay, another one here, not looking at the overall risk profile. So, if you have all of your risks listed in your risk log, let's say you have 20 risks, you can do something about each individual item. You can mitigate each risk. If you look at the collective of all of these risks, you may see a different pattern. And you may come to see that actually putting all of these risks together, we need to do something else. Because putting all these risks together is creating a, a third risk. <clears throat> uh, so you need to look at the overall risk profile. You need to look at, at, at what all these risks aggregated actually really means for the project and what you can do about it. Not communicating risks and openly discussing them. So this is back to the steering committee meeting and what you're going uh, to do with what you identify. A leadership trait is that you are able and that you are comfortable talking about the real risks of the project. You know, when you go into a steering committee meeting or when you write that weekly uh, status report, if I am, a, as an executive, I, what do I want to see? I want to see your milestones, that you're hitting your milestones, or if there's any risks around hitting the milestones. And then I want to see an overview of your top three to five risks and what you're going to do about it and who owns it. And then I want to know if you need any help from me as the executive. So are there any risks that you need to escalate to me? That's my concern as an executive, as a steering committee member, or as a sponsor. I want to know what could go wrong here. So don't try to hide the risks. Uh, you can also use your allies on the project, your senior stakeholders who are on board. Use them to help you mitigate big risks that you cannot deal with yourself. It's a great way to create um, a stronger bond with your stakeholders because they will know that you are on to the right thing and that you care and that you're a good leader if you're really good at highlighting and identifying and mitigating the big risks of the project. Now. Let me share with you how you can lead a risk workshop. <clears throat> because the risk workshop is one of the quickest ways to creating a collaborative risk culture and making sure that you have uh, joint ownership of the risks. This picture here is actually from Shanghai uh, some years back where I went uh, to run some training out there and um, I thought it was a good action picture here. You can see that it actually um, putting post-it notes on pieces of paper and that's exactly what you should be doing in a collaborative risk workshop. So I have four steps for you here. The first step is you get your team or whoever is involved in this risk workshop, I, I propose your core team, maybe with some outside people, maybe with some key um, senior stakeholders who are very bought into the, pro to the project. You bring a stack of post-it notes or sticky notes as the Americans call them and you have some uh, tape with you and you have some flip chart paper. Then you give every team member a stack of sticky notes or post-it notes and you ask them to identify anything that could go wrong in this project. One item per post-it note. That means one risk per post-it note. Um, at this point you're not filtering anything. You're just getting people to brainstorm. And then you put all of these uh, sticky notes up on the wall or up on a flip chart. So we look at what is it really, what are all these risks, what is everything that could go wrong, risk to do with uh, technology, with people, with budgets, with 
uh, aligning the product to, to strategy, understanding use and needs, all kinds of stuff that could go wrong. Right, when you cannot think of any more, you draw up the risk matrix that I showed under step three and four. You have likelihood on the horizontal axis and impact on the vertical axis. And then you simply take each post-it note at a time and in collaboration you place it on the matrix. You don't have to do, you actually don't have to participate. As a project manager, you can be the facilitator. So imagine you have a flip chart, you've drawn this matrix on the flip chart, and one by one, you take each post-it note and say, so people, uh, team, where are we going to place it? This is a uh, risk that um, <clears throat> uh, that's going to be a hardware failure. Right, do we think there's a likelihood of one, two, three? Do we think there's an impact on one, two, three? Uh, no, the likelihood is low. Okay, it's a low likelihood of, of hardware failure. If it happens, um, it's a high impact. So you put that under low likelihood and high impact. And that's how you go through all of the post-it notes. You are not steering the process. You should not dominate the process. You should let the team uh, agree where to put these post-it notes. That's how you get engagement. So it's very important that you're not too controlling as a project manager. Let the team do the work. And you are simply the facilitator moving post-it notes around. Of course, you can participate, but you, you, you see what I'm saying. Don't be controlling. After you have placed all the sticky notes on the, uh, in the chart, you take a marker pen, can be any color, doesn't have to be blue, and you draw a line where you feel the risk appetite is of the project or of your organization. Again, it's not you drawing it as a project manager. You ask your team, where are we going to draw the line? Just as a reminder, what does the line mean? The line means that anything towards the top right-hand corner is what you're going to do something about. They're all the risks that you're going to look to uh, mitigate and to reduce and to avoid, etc. Anything uh, towards the bottom left-hand corner, you're not going to do anything about. Where you draw the line depends on the risk appetite of your company, and it depends on the risk appetite of your project. Can you afford for anything to go wrong on your project? So in collaboration, you draw the line. The next step is then to draw the risk register. And you simply transfer the post-it notes that were at the top right-hand corner of your chart to the risk register. You list what the likelihood and impact was, let's say on a scale from one to one to three. That means that your combined score, L times I, the maximum score here is nine. You can use another scale. Uh, let's go back to this chart. You can use a scale from one to five uh, or whatever scale you want. If you use a scale from one to five, of course, the maximum impact, the combined impact here, likelihood and impact is 25. So you can use any scale you want. This is just really to show, um, to give a way of, um, of quantifying uh, your risks and looking at the severity. Then, as we said before, you are going to go through with your teams, what are we going to do about each of these risks? Which response are we going to take? Are we going to reduce it? Are we going to, are we going to um, share it with a vendor? Are we going to, well, what are we going to do? But it's not enough to just write, we're going to reduce it. No, what are we actually going to do to reduce the risk? Are we going to run prototypes to, to reduce the risk of, uh, of untested technology delaying the project or creating more work? Um, and as you identify the actions here, remember, to look at two things. How are we going to lower the likelihood of the risk? That's the root cause. Also, what are we going to do to lower the impact in case the risk happens? There are two very different types of risk responses that you can reduce both of them. So, as an example, let's say you're running that outdoor event. You're running an outdoor concert and there's a risk of rain. What are you going to do to lower the root cause of your um, of, of the rain where well, you can uh, the root cause is about rain you know it's difficult to <laughs> all you can do is move it to a different location move it to a season where it's less likely to rain what are you going to do to lower the impact in case it does rain that's when we can distribute umbrellas or ponchos or put up a marquee so I always want you to consider both of these aspects 
good risk management means that you, um, again, going back to the to the um, to the previous slide, that you move the risks down on both axes. You lower the likelihood and you lower the impact. Okay, then assigning owners, you're doing that in your risk work collaboratively. Again, it is not you as a risk as a project manager saying, John, I want you to own this risk. No, it's not right. You list out all the actions and then in collaboration we say, who is the best person to own this risk? Is someone in this room able to own the risk or do we need to draw someone else in? That is really the best way to get collaboration, to get buy-in, to get shared ownership so that you as a project manager don't end up owning all of the risks. That's a very important point. The date here is just a date by when the action must be taken. You can include other fields in your risk list. I've seen very, very uh, long, complicated risk lists, but really, the, at the minimum, you must write down what action you're going to take and who owns the risk, who is responsible for making sure the action happens. That is the minimum that you need to include in your risk register. Now, back to the management uh, versus leadership element here. I want you not just to go through the motions of risk management. I very much want you to be leaders, want to think. And one of the ways you can do that is to take what I call a helicopter view. Take a step back from your project on a regular basis. What's really going on here? What does your gut tell you? Do not underestimate what your gut is telling you. Are we on the right track? What are we missing out here? What are we not seeing? What have we forgotten about? What's the overall risk profile of the project? Does this feel right or is there something, you know, is my internal navigation system telling me that there's something we missed out? So it's very important that you can add that leadership element, taking a step back, removing yourself from the process and just looking at it, observing it, maybe asking other people out there, from your experience, what could go wrong here? What have we missed? And um, the last bullet here, did you know that risk can be estimated? Um, and, um, and how do we do that? <clears throat> I say here in dollars, pounds, in, 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 in any currency really, but you can add to your risk register an amount. How do you calculate the amount of a risk? Let's say there is a 50% chance that technology is going to break down on your pro that hardware is going to break down. Let's make it simple. There's a 50% chance, that, that's quite high by the way, 50% <laughs> chance that your hardware is going to fail. It's a risk. It's a big risk. Then you say, okay, what's the cost in case our hardware fails? Well, it's going to cost us uh, $10,000. If hardware fails, it will cost us $10,000 to fix it. Okay, because there's a 50% likelihood, the um, cost of that risk is 50% of the $10,000, so that's $5,000. So you can go through each of your risks, look at how much it would cost you in case that risk materialized, and then you just need to uh, times that uh, with the, the probability. If there's only a 10% probability that a risk will materialize, then the cost of the risk is 10% of the impact. I hope that makes sense. I haven't seen many people put that in the risk list, uh, but I think it's a good, it can be a good thing to do because when you add the cost of all your risks up, you actually have a budget that you can assign to your risks. Um, so you see, it's not great to just go out to your managers and say, oh, we have some uncertainty on the project, let's put an extra contingency budget. That contingency should only be to cover the unknown unknowns, i.e. the risk you don't know about. All these other risks that you have in your risk list, you know about them. You can estimate them. So it's a really good way to quantify um, your risks in, in, in dollar terms, on pound terms or whatever, um, to make it more material and to say what, what, what's, what's the real impact in, in, uh, in financial terms of our risks. One last thing before we wrap up, and again, thank you to all of you who have stayed on. I know that we're going over time because we had some issues earlier on with the sound. So I do appreciate all of you who are hanging on there. One last thing. What is your own personal risk attitude? And why on earth am I asking about that? 
because some people, some project managers, have a high risk appetite. You gladly take risks, and that will impact your risk appetite on a project. Other people are very, very risk averse. They hate risks, and they want to go with belts and braces, as we say in English. They want to uh, check and double check and make sure we've thought about everything. They're overly conservative. If that's your risk attitude, again, that will impact your behavior. You're going to be very, very conservative and risk averse on your project. Again, that impacts your risk culture. So I'm bringing this up because you need to be aware of how your own risk attitude is affecting the way that you come across on your project. If you are a very uh, risk averse person who is working for an organization who loves to take risks, then you may be overly conservative. Maybe you may be too conservative for your project and that would impact uh, the way that risk management happens. So there is no right or wrong here. I'm simply bringing this to your attention because I would like you to be aware of your own impact on this process. Are you uncomfortable with risks? Are you okay with risks? And how does that fit in? Does it conflict or does it complement the risk appetite of your company and of your organization? If you love to take risks, then maybe you need to be a little bit more stringent when it comes to risk management on your project because maybe you are not wanting to see all the risk because your personal profile is such that you like to accept risks. So I really just bring this up to make you aware that you do impact uh, risks and uh, risk culture in your company and I just want you to be aware of how you are doing that. Just a very brief summary, some of the key takeaways do involve people, do have collaborative risk workshops that you are running that is very, very fundamental to a good uh, risk management process so that you can begin to create a risk culture. Listen to your gut instinct, be a leader, take a step back. Does this make sense? Are we on the right track? What have we not thought about? So important. This is not just about following a process. Risk management is really about leadership. It's about leading your team through uncharted territory. Remember the positive risks. they are opportunities. Things that might happen, such as new technology coming along, whilst you already have locked yourself into technology choices. How can you leverage new technology on the fly that's a positive risk. It, it could be beneficial if you are ready and agile enough to embrace it. But that needs to be talked about and thought about in advance. Never ignore the important risks and always talk about them. Discuss important risks with your senior stakeholders, with your sponsor, uh, especially in the steering committee meetings. It's going to make you stand out as someone who is in control, who knows what they're doing and who's not afraid of talking about the things that could really uh, impact the project. And always assign owners to risks, not just yourself, please. We looked at the nine-step risk management process, identifying risks, analyzing root causes, determining impact and probability, deciding on the right risk response. This is where you look at either reducing the risk, accepting the risk, transferring it or sharing it and always look at how you can lower the impact of a risk as well as the likelihood. Assigning owners and collaboration, we've talked about at length, documenting risks in your risk register, communicating them through weekly reports and in the uh, monthly steering committee meetings, if you have such steering committee meetings, which I'm hoping, and finally, regularly review the risks. That is a summary of everything we went through. What did you take from this? Please go back over your notes and capture your learning points. What are you going to do differently as a result of this? Are you going to start running collaboratively, collaborative risk workshops with post-it notes or sticky notes and uh, where you are the facilitator? I think your team will enjoy being involved. They'll enjoy being asked what they feel could go wrong in the project. As I said before, you can gain access to all of my resources for free on my website, suzannematson.com or suzannematson.co.uk. 
it will take you to exactly the same place. There will be one of the tabs called resources. When you click on the resources tab, you can register to get access to my resources for free, completely for free. There's lots of templates for you to download. One of them is a risks and an issues log. Right, and that is my website once again, suzannematson.com or suzannematson.co.uk. I have both of those domain names. With that having said, we are concluding the webinar. Thank you, thank you for your patience. Thank you, thank you for those of you who are holding on. Um, please go to my website, suzannematson.com, if you want to know more. Also connect with me on LinkedIn and on Twitter. My Twitter ID, suzannematson.com. If you want to know more, and being a be a project leader, I, I do encourage you to get hold of my latest uh, book, The Power of Project Leadership, which, as I said, very excitingly, is actually being translated to Chinese as we speak. Um, anything else, connect with me on Twitter or LinkedIn. Feel free to ask questions. Feel free to use all of the resources on my own website, susannemaston.com. And I cannot thank you enough for having stayed throughout this webinar um, and, be, and have, having been patient with us. Um, thank you so much. This concludes the webinar from today. Have a great rest of your Wednesday. Bye-bye. Thank you all who took part in this presentation. If you have any questions or would like to get in touch with Ms. Madsen, please email her at mail at suzannemadsen.com. For more webinars, please visit our website at www.softexpert.com. See you next time.